everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Wrestling Heroes and Insiders podcast. You know what it is. I am Deshaun, Whip Dog Whipple, and I am here with my partner. Devastating Daryl Pace in the control yes. room. What's going on, Daryl? Oh, you man, it's, it's going great, man. I was a little nervous about coming on today because, I, you know, I didn't, you know, our guest it was scaring me a little bit. So, so I... At first, I thought you said he's coming to the control center, so I was real nervous about coming in today. Hey, man, I was too, and I've known him for years because we got a monster in the building today, a true to life monster, and I want to welcome welcome him to the show, Mister Congo Kong. How you doing today, sir? Man, I can't complain. Blessed and highly flavored, favored, whatever. My God, my God. I'm glad you didn't put the makeup, I mean, the, the, the face paint, the war paint on today, because we would have had to go without video. I couldn't have taken it, man. <laughs> so to all our listeners, just want to let everybody know, this is another episode that is during the COVID-19 uh, season. So if you hear us refer to that, that's why. So, Kong, speaking of that, how are you holding up, man? I know you travel all the time, man. How are you holding up right now? <laughs> during this COVID season? You know, for uh, wrestling being uh, my main income and my main way of making a living, I'm not I'm not starving. Uh, thank God for backup income. You know, I, I make wrestling gear. So uh, when people got their stimulus checks, I got stimulated. So. <laughs> nice, nice, man. Well, well Colin, I you know, I've known you for years, man. And, and Daryl, I gotta let you know, I had the honor of being uh, Death Valley driver by this man one time in a, a, a area in Jackson, in Michigan. But with that being said, I was doing some research on you, man. I didn't know you started back in 98. I didn't know you've been around that long, oh, man. Can you tell us a little bit how you started? Yeah, man. 21 years. Uh, I, uh, I went to Saginaw Valley State University to play football. I had a scholarship there for a year. I uh, didn't like it, didn't really get along with my teammates, stuff like that. And so I was kind of looking for an out, I guess. But I'd always wanted to be a pro wrestler since I was a kid. And I happened to uh, to wander into uh, a, a, a video game store called Funko Land uh, yeah. back in the day. If that takes you back to, to, to when we were young, yeah. Um, and I saw a sign on the wall for uh, – for a local independent show coming up and they said if you want to become a pro wrestler call this number so i called that number and was introduced to a guy that went by the name of scotty z okay okay so you just said you've always wanted to be a wrestling a wrestler who were some of your influences growing up i would have to say hogan andre the giant undertaker yokozuna vader uh, Bam Bam Bigelow, Yoko, I said Yokozuna, yeah. Um, the bigger guys, the larger than life characters, you know. Um, the smaller guys were cool, but like I wanted to be the big guy. I want to be the top, top dog. I either wanted to be in the Hulk Hogan spot or the guy that, that would beat up Hulk Hogan. Hulk Hogan. So, okay. you know, yeah. You, you like that monster factory, those guys that they're getting, you know, old, you know the, the Giants getting ready for Hogan, or or if you looked at the NWA, the uh, the Terry Gordys or the Dr. Depp, so the, the, the larger than life. We were, we were the ones that made the money for the territory, so if uh, if promoters would know what they were doing these days, they probably could make a little bit, little bit more money. Well, between that and there being so many of them. Yeah. So growing up, you, you know, just like me, you're a big dude. Were, were, were you a big guy when you were younger, or did you just shoot up after you hit about 17, 18? Uh, nope. I've been uh, – I've, I've always been the biggest kid in my class. Um, well, one of the biggest kid, kids in my class. I've always been ridiculously strong for, you know, my age and size or whatever. And, um, yeah. You know, and, and once I got into football, I just kind of excelled from there. Football and wrestling in high school. Okay, okay. Now, you just talked about you always like being one of the big guys in the ring, working a big man style. That's what you enjoy. But you can move. And if you guys have never watched Kong Go Kong, and let me make sure I got his plan back here. I got one, I'm going to have one of your matches on the screen back here, too. You can you <laughs> decide that even though you were doing the big man style for the most part, 
you was hitting that run and dive in the corner. You was going off the top rope, and you was doing all that stuff. Once again, I felt some of his uh, moves before. So, yeah, that boy can go. What made you want to work like that, man? I wanted to be different. I didn't want to be the uh, the the same or the typical big man who only did a big boot and a choke slam type thing. You know what I mean? I wanted to to show that I can be athletic and know, um, and maybe not at first, uh, but know when to to uh, exhibit it and how to exhibit it and show it and you know make people go, oh wow, and then still want to come back for more. You know, so not not give away too much at one point. Now, you started off in, in football, and then when you transition to, to the wrestling, and you see the Ad and Funkle, and you go to wrestling school, you know, what was the awakening? Because you've been through football camp, so you know what that's about. You get into a wrestling camp. What, what, what would be an eye What was the experience there? What, tell us a little bit about it. Well, you know, uh, I had two practices before I had my first match um, because we had a guy there that, that – the, the guy that owned the company was a real estate mogul – and he really didn't know anything about uh, pro wrestling, and so he felt like since we were since we were paying to be trained that we had to be on the show. And so he put me in a match, and, and uh, they they called for me to give the guy a spear. Me being what two weeks removed from from college football at that point, um, I give him a spear, but like I like legit thought I knocked him out because <laughs> he couldn't move afterwards and I'm like uh what do I do I'm panicking I'm like I, 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 I don't know I don't know freaking out because I've I legit form tackle this kid and um it ended up working out but like that was just one of those moments that you know kind of told me that I had to had to tone it back a little bit you know it's not as real as you might think it is or not as as uh full goal as you think it is for sure now Sitting here speaking with you, and I, like I said, I've known you for a minute. You're one of the most well-spoken wrestlers I've ever met behind the scenes. And I, I don't want to break the gimmick, but I'm saying you, you always have been. How did you, were you able to tap into something different to bring that calm side? Because calm doesn't speak. Even when you were Osiris, you didn't do a whole lot of talking in either. So how did you uh, uh, tone that down and find that Congo calm character, man? You know, I just, I wanted to be different. Um, when it was originally presented to me, it was presented to me as a mix of Umaga and Kamala. Um, I liked Umaga's silence, um, but I wanted to come off as intelligent, which I unfortunately don't feel like Kamala was always portrayed in that light. Um, so I figured, hey, Ultimate Warrior is a savage. You know, he, he talks and you, he says a bunch of nonsense that, that, you know, you can throw together and kind of figure out what he's saying. What if I could just, just use my body language, you know, and facial expressions and, and see, see how far that, that goes for me and see if I can use a manager to, uh, to help, you know, convey whatever message it is that we're trying to, trying to, trying to convey. Now, I have known that you wrestled all over the world, man. What are your favorite places to wrestle at? And name some of your top opponents, man. Ooh, um, I love Newfoundland. Newfoundland is uh, an island on the eastern side of Canada, the easternmost part of uh, the the North American continent, actually. Um, very cold there, really close to, to Iceland and Greenland. Um, the people are there super friendly. I've, I've never had an issue where I felt like I was out of place or anything like that. Um, that's one of my places, favorite places to go. The other place would be to India. I actually got to go and do a tour for Great Khali a couple years ago. And uh, we did two shows, but we were there for a total of two weeks. Uh, we did a bunch of press. And we got to see a lot of the countryside, a lot of uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, what are the name of the mountains over there? The, the Himalayan Himalayan. mountain ridge. I can't think of it. The Himalayan, yes, yes. Um, Jesus, people are blowing up my ah. We still there? People are blowing up my Facebook, and I'm trying to trying to zero it out. Um, but uh, yeah, we went. We were we spent a lot of time in Him Himalayas, and the two shows that we did, we had crowds of that were estimated to be thirty thousand or more. 
And so like they're in these big giant parks and like just people from miles and miles around. And it was crazy. It was nuts. Like talk about being, being uh, treated like a God there. It was, yeah, it was nice. Now, now when you transitioned into wrestling, uh, you know, you were going for playing football. You, are you, is that your full-time living? Are you doing something on the side? You know, how is that? You know, we hear about those horror stories of people eating out of potatoes and out of their car. You know, how, how is it for you when you're, when you're starting up like that? Um, when I first started, um, I, I held a job um, for 11 years. I worked with special needs individuals um, as well as wrestling. And I, I stayed there even though, you know, it wasn't the – the greatest paying job, but I could always get time off when I needed it. So I was, I was able to travel and go places and do things with wrestling. Uh, then once I made it to Impact, um, I was able to quit. I was blessed enough to quit. And so that was three, I'd say going on four years ago, and I still haven't had a regular job. So between, excuse me, the wrestling, um, training, which I have my own wrestling school uh, here in Indiana and in Bluffton, Indiana, to be exact, uh, which is 30 miles south of Fort Wayne, uh, and called Professor Cog's Wrestling Academy. Figured I'd throw that shameless plug in there. Um, between that and making gear, I've, I've been doing all right for the last three years. You, you heard what he said, Daryl, while he's talking about his school, he's in Indiana now. He left us to Michigan. He don't want to be here in Michigan with a snowball, man. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I go to Michigan and I'm there for a little bit and I'm like, ah, you know, it's time to go back home. Like, it was cool. It was nice to visit, but I, I, I can't imagine myself living back here. I get it. Well, we're we going to touch base on impact. We don't even talk about Juggalo in a second. But before we do this, I got to ask this, man, because I see you. You love her to death and that's a beautiful thing. You love your mama, man. But what did your mama say when you first started wanting to be a wrestler? Because I know what my mama said. But what did your mama say, and when did she start realizing it's not just a, a fun game? This ain't a joke for him. Like this is serious. Yeah, she wasn't. She wasn't down at first. She was like, "You need to go to school and get your education." And I don't know what you're thinking about doing this wrestling and blah blah blah. And um, you know, worse than her was having to deal with my grandmother's. You can't serve God and wrestle too. And blah. I was like, whoa. <laughs> Um, but eventually she, she, she came around when she started seeing me take flights. When, when, you know, I'm like, all right, mom, I'm flying out to such and such for a show. Did you pay for that? No, ma, they paid for it. They bought the hotel and the airplane ticket and all that stuff. Oh, okay. Well, this must be really working out. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. All right. Well, go ahead and do it. Go on and get it, baby. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. 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 Now, with that being said, I also noticed you're very strong in your faith, man. How is that balancing your faith and knowing the wrestling world that we are in? Some people are not on the same wavelength. And so how is that being a wrestler and balancing that? For me, wrestling is a ministry. And I, I say that to people and they look at me and they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. Wrestling is the ultimate story of good versus evil. Um, you throw out the doctrine and, 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 you know, different faiths and beliefs and, and practices and whatever. That's all it is, is good versus evil with good overcoming in the end. So when you take that, that mindset in, into it, that's when you can go in and through your work in the ring um, and, you know, your promos and whatever, you can, you can affect people's lives. You can, you can make things better for them. And it's amazing to, to know that I've been given a platform that I can go out and do these things with it. You know, I, I, I can't consider myself anything but blessed because of that. And what's that like in the locker room? Because when you go in the locker rooms, you know, uh, you know as Deshaun said, we got all kinds of different kinds of people. I mean, do you get an opportunity to mentor to some folks? And then, and, and how difficult is it, you know, with that lifestyle and some of the temptations that might get thrown around you? Well, <laughs> um, let's see. How do I put this? My my faith in God is not the same as uh, my faith in religion, I guess. 
because I can, I feel like I can commune with God without having to go to church or be a part of a church. It took me a while to get to that point. That's beyond the point. But uh, um, really just, just, you know, knowing, knowing your, your limits, your own personal limits, you know, what you can and cannot do, who you can and cannot hang out with. Um, and, you know, how how far they're willing to go may not be how far you're willing to go and you you just have to know you have to be strong and steadfast in what you're doing and and not not fall into that that category of temptation or whatever now since we're talking about backstage and before i say this this is not a knock on against anybody but you also work with them uh insane clowns if you will over there in juggalo championship wrestling man We've heard the stories. How was it working for JCW, man? Working for them, uh, I didn't have too many issues. You know, there were times where they'd be like, oh, uh, uh, we need one of you to, to, to bleed tonight, and we're going to put you in a cage match. And I'm like, oh, we, we didn't talk about this beforehand. But, you know, things ended up working out to where, you know, uh, they got what they wanted, and I still kept myself safe because I'm just not a, a fan of or don't believe in, you know what I'm saying, cutting myself, you know, for a few dollars. That's not not, uh, not, part, of my, not part of my ministry. Um, but, you know, fortunately through that uh, and, and being there as long as I have been, I've been one of the, the – only people that that have lasted this long so it's kind of crazy like you know to see some of the other people the names or whatever that they they had and they built um you know i i've been one of the few that haven't had an issue with management or um you know haven't been fired or or whatever reason you know whatever over these years and and so i thought that was pretty cool um but yeah, man, like the, the weirdest thing is the, the fans sometimes, you know, they're, they're a whole different breed of human being, really. And like, I don't know if you've ever been to a gathering, but it's something I suggest that you go check out just at least once in your life, um, you know, so you can you can see exactly <laughs> what goes on there. And it, it can be a hot mess, that's for sure. Yeah. Shout out to the Juggalos, man. Um, yeah, shout out to the Juggalos, Juggalettes, Juggalettes or whatever. Um, with that being said, we know you kind of transitioned from JCW, and I know you still work for them, but also going into Impact. Uh, shout out to Johnny Bravo and uh, D-Ray 3000. They both talked very highly of you. On, we had them as previous guests on the show. So uh, you, got in, <laughs> you got in through – you was in Global Force Wrestling first, right? Yeah, but, uh, yeah, yeah. I did uh did the three years of Global Force. Um and everybody thinks that Jeff Jarrett and I or Jeff Jarrett brought me into Impact, which is not true. Jeff Jarrett got there the same time I got there. Um I had actually been brought in or given a tryout, set up my tryout was set up through Abyss. And uh we had done a, a couple tag team matches all over the place and then we'd wrestle each other a couple of times and he said, you deserve to be on TV. There's no way that, that you shouldn't be on TV. And he said, so I'm going to do whatever I can uh, to make sure you get there. And I, um, at that point had been 18 years in the business. So, you know, I, I'm under the impression that I'll believe it when I see it. But then one day he, he messaged me and he's like, Hey, he's like, I, I got, some dates for you for impact you just got to get your airplane ticket and uh you know we'll, we'll bring you down there and get you a tryout match and so uh i went and i wrestled uh uh caleb conley and we put on a a, a pretty good match in the, the the six minutes that we were given and um uh they didn't need to see anymore at that point. And they, they, they were like, we're going to bring you back with full story and, and uh, we'll see you next month. Now, how did you actually enjoy working for impact, man? Cause like you said, it was, your I loved it. Okay. I loved it. Uh, I loved going down to universal studios and um, I didn't really get to go into the park, but you know, I met a lot of cool people down there and uh you know, getting to work there, work in that type of environment. You know, I I I feel like I'm I'm a little more ready for TV or for 
you know, movies or acting or stuff like that, because I, I now have that experience, you know, as a part of a, a weekly TV, TV show uh, for two years of my life. And, um, you know, that opened up doors to, to me going to other places like, like China and, and India and, you know, uh, Puerto Rico, all over the place. And how is that exposure? Do you get us not, you know, recognized, you know, going through airports now because you're on TV and, you know, and, and you're a big guy, so you're going to stand out. And, you know, what, you know, what's that like? Usually if I get recognized, it's because I'm wearing my shirt and people are like, oh, oh, oh wait, that's you. I, oh, yeah, that's me. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it, it's the, the cool part about paint is you can lay low key. And you don't always have to be bothered or whatever, even if you, you see somebody that you might know or you might think may know you or, or whatever. Uh, the, 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 the weirdest thing about going through airports and such is, is uh, when you go through security and, and you got a, a big jar of protein or you have a championship belt and they want to pull it out and, oh, what's this? What kind of exhibition fighting are you doing? And uh, I'm like, oh. <laughs> Well, you just talked about doing possible acting and things, but you've done a little bit already, man. I saw the music video you were in, man. How did that come about, man? Um, they just contacted me, and they were like, hey, we have an idea for a music video, and we'd like to use you in it. And I was like, okay, tell me where. And it happened to be at a place that I had gone to Russell a million times before. So I was like, yeah, okay, I'm down. <laughs> And so, uh, you know, they they set it up and, and I went down and uh, uh, it got shot and then it was featured on Impact's website for a long time. So I thought that was pretty cool. Shout out the group right quick in case people don't know the name of the group. If you can shout them out. Mm. <laughs> I don't even put them on the spot. I'm sorry. I don't even think they're together anymore. Oh, okay. um, I'm trying to think of their name. Uh, the song is called Pressure, and uh, yeah, I can't think of the group's name. I don't, yeah, they're not even together anymore. So, like, it was like we did that, and then they got the, the exposure on, on the website and on YouTube and stuff like that. And then they were like, out, oh, we're out. So, if I remember later, I'll say it, but I can't, okay, I can't what's remember. Up, what's up, what's up? Well, I do want to go back to what I was saying earlier. Like I said, I've seen you wrestle some of the top guys in the world, man. What were some of your favorite matches that you've had? Ooh, I would have to say um, some of my favorite opponents would be, like, more of the indie guys. Uh, and that would be guys like Hillbilly Jed from down in Indianapolis and Shane Mercer from Kentucky. Um <sighs> I've slept since my last match. Cody Diener is another one. Uh, we put together some really good stuff up in Canada. Um, but one of my favorite uh, stars most recently was got to be in the ring with Papa Shango. Talk about a surreal experience. You know, we, we do this spot where uh, he's tagging with a guy and I'm tagging with a guy. And it's, it's crazy because our gimmicks would work better together than they would against each other as as the same as our two partners and so we do a, a four-way standoff or whatever and uh he starts chanting and he's doing his voodoo chant or whatever and so slowly we start turning towards our tag team partners and like they're talking to each other and they look and whoa 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 we're together stop hey snap out <laughs> so it's a cool little moment you know to, to, to go in there and have that that uh that experience you know with, with Papa Shango I I you couldn't have told 10 year old me watching watching uh uh Papa Shango make that goo run down Ultimate Warrior's face you know all those years ago and setting that guy's feet on fire all those years ago that I get to share a ring with that man and and, and not only that but 20 years into my career how crazy is that yeah for sure for sure now I know you had a did a, you did a seminar before, um, and I know it was a big man seminar. So, with your school, do you only like to train big guys, or do you train everybody? And what do you look for? Uh, 
my seminars are that was something that he he wanted to target specifically to try to get people there. I talk just like I normally do. Um, my biggest thing in pro wrestling today is how do we lose? How do we not lose sight of the wrestling aspect of wrestling? Um, to me, a lot of the guys they get in there and they go so fast and they do so much and they don't take the time to sell and take breaks in between their spots and their matches don't really look like they involve very much wrestling. And if you don't have wrestling in pro wrestling, then it looks more so like a dance and you probably need to rethink your career, you know, um, making things make sense, you know, psychology, not, not overexposing moves and not doing moves that make the fans think that we are in there on the trampoline because it's not, and you don't look any tougher you know, getting drop on your head and getting back up uh, than your opponent or anything like that. You guys both look stupid, for lack of a better term. You make wrestling look stupid. You you expose us for for being something that we shouldn't be. You know, and and we're not we're not ballerinas. We're not you know dancers. We don't do uh, choreographed stuff. You know, like that. It's supposed to emulate a real fight. That's what wrestling is supposed to be. And that's the type of thing that I try to teach. I try to teach uh, good psychology and, and, and you know, put the, the whys behind the what's. And what's your style with that? I, you know, I've heard some of the stories where people will come up with a script, you know, and it's line by line. You know, I know I would never, I always ask the question, I know I can never do that because I can't remember, I can't remember what I did yesterday, let alone 50 things in a row. Is your style right. more, you know, like that? Or is it more like, you know, the old days where people just called in the ring? You know, what's, what's your preference when you're, you're working with another guy? It's a mix of both. Um, I'm a, uh, I like to call certain points. Like, so we'll start with the finish and then, uh, then we'll work our way back. And I really only need a couple of transition spots, you know what I mean? But the rest, we should be able to go in there and fill the crowd and listen to them and um, uh, get our story over, you know, and, and be able to listen to the referee or the timekeeper or whatever and, and know where we are in the match and how much time we got left and stuff like that. And, excuse me, uh, be able to uh, kick, kick into different gears, you know, based on that stuff. Okay. No, I got to ask this. Uh, being a brother in the business, I know what I dealt with, especially back when we first, you know, back then when we started. Because I think I started, you started around 98, yeah, I was around 99, 2000. It was even different then, as you know. How did you mm -hmm. handle being a brother in a predominantly uh, white or other uh, race business and the progression of where you're at now with black men in wrestling? Ooh, um, to look back at some of the guys I broke in with, um, and I won't name names, um, but I could always tell that I got treated different and I would try not to, um, blame it on race or anything like that. But, you know, after a while, you know, you can only call a duck by so many names before you have to actually call it a duck. And, you know, I just look back at, you know, how once I, I left the West Michigan area and I moved down to Indiana to play college football again for three years, um, once I got back into wrestling and I would run into some of those guys, uh, I would notice that they would still have that, that same kind of mentality towards me. But then all of a sudden I started to elevate, you know, and things just got better and better for me. And then, you know, all of a sudden, like some of their demeanor towards me would change, you know, and instead of being oh yeah, that's, that's Osiris, you know, some big galoot, you know what I'm saying, running out, hurting people or whatever. Now it's, oh, hey, that's Congo Kong, man. I, I would, I trained with him. We, we came up together and, you know, that's my guy. And, and, you know, him and Jimmy Jacobs were the, the, the top two in our class, you know, to do anything in this business. It, 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 I'm glad you touched that. Cause of all, I I always mess with Bravo about that as well. I'm like, man, and Bravo says the same thing. You know, when he was just doing his thing around here, people said, what up? But as you start getting to the next level, it's funny how mm -hmm. they want to tag your name and everything and act like you guys are best friends from day one. So that, that's, I'm glad you touched on that, man. 
<laughs> so just to make sure, so currently you're not signed to Impact right now, correct? Correct, not signed to Impact. Um, that actually expired February of last year. And I wanted them to, to put out, you know, a notice saying, hey, you know, we wish Congo Kong the best in, in his future endeavors. And I think it kind of messed me up by them not doing that, um, you know, because it kind of just let me fizzle out as opposed to, to hey, this is going on. You know, we've, we've cut ties with him and now he's a free agent or whatever. And it's just, you know, it's been rough um, as far as trying to get my foot into a, a door anymore because of my character, because it, it doesn't fit in, I guess, everywhere, which I don't understand. Anywhere anywhere pro wrestling is and you're trying to get children in, hi, I'm your guy. <laughs> you know, children, they love me. They, they, they're scared at first. And then once they, uh, once they, they get past that fear, they're like, oh my God, Congo Kong is the coolest thing ever. Let me buy his merch. Let me buy, let me, let me talk to him and, you know, go see him at intermission. And, um, you know, I have my parents send him messages and stuff like that because he's so awesome. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. And I'm still, like I said, I'm fortunate enough to still make money on the indies and do what I do that way. Yeah. And how have you, have you seen the business change? Like when we started off, we had territories then we moved into like the big three, big two. Now we're in this world where we've got the big one with, you know, but we got AEW and we got, you know, TN or Impact, you know, there too. And we've got a lot of territories again. And now we're seeing guys take more ownership, you know, we're being able to say, you know what, I'm not going to sign any contract with anybody. I'm going to be freelance. I'm going to work everywhere. I mean, how have you seen that, you know, and how has that helped you? Is it, you know, are you seeing the reaping kind of the benefits of that change? Um, not really. I guess I wouldn't say directly in any, any way. Um, you know, I, I would I would like to know that I'm making a certain amount of money per year, you know, and I have so many, so many dates or whatever. Um, but I feel like, you know, a lot of times dealing with those companies, you're dealing with the good old boys club, for lack of a better term. And, you know, if you're not one of their friends, then uh, you're not going to be you know, you're not going to be included, you know, the same as, you know, one of them, I guess. Now, I've called, I've told you multiple times, I, me personally, I think you're the best big man in wrestling. I've told you that multiple times. But I appreciate that. Let's say, like you just spoke on the old good boy, old boys network. Trust me, I know all about it. But if they end up five years from now, not hiring you as a wrestler, but saying, you know what, we want to bring him in as an agent, like they did Abyss, like they did Hurricane. How would you feel about something like that? And I'm not just saying one specific company. I'm saying any uh, prominent company. Man, hire me. Right. <laughs> I would love to be able to share the stuff that I've learned over the last 20 years um, and take it to, you know, a broader, a broader stage because there's just, in my opinion, there's things that, that, you know, the old school wrestlers did that we miss out on today that, you know, would make wrestling so much better. You know, things like slowing down, taking your time, selling. Selling is huge. They don't realize, you know, you the more you do to a guy and he still kicks out at the end of a match, the worse you look. You don't look strong at all. Now, and how do you think that changed, man? Because, and, and I'm not knocking any workers now, but that, that fast pace, that back-to-back, boom, 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 no selling, it, 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 no psychology. Why do you think that changes? Do you think it's the attention span of the fan or the workers just want to, as we always say, get your shit in? I think uh, it's a combination of the internet. Uh, fans have an access to behind the curtain through the internet. Um, and knowing all the inside terms and terminology and and uh, what is what and really just expecting more. Um, they want to be wild with everything. They want everything to be uh, crazy and, and flippy and, and exciting instead of, you know, uh, sitting on the edge of their seat. You know, they want you to do cartwheels the entire match instead of wait for that one big flip at the end of the match. 
And uh, I think through that, you know, we, we lose sight of how to tell a story because they're so busy trying to, trying to wow them with, hey, I can do this cool move. I can do this cool combo, this setup for this, this kind of way. And um, we, don't, we don't take note of, okay, the stuff that you're doing doesn't make sense because of the way you're doing it. Like slow down, take your time, sell in between. You're gonna get some more mileage out of your body um, I, I, so many guys come in and, and they, they start off hot and then five years later, they're done. Oh man, I can't do anymore. My body, man. Oh, my bump card, blah, blah, blah. I was like, yeah, I, I should have told you. I mean, I, I thought I told you, you know, you should have listened, you know, you get a bump card. And it, if you fill that out, you know, quick, fast, and in a hurry, that's on you. Five years in versus my 21 years, you know what I'm saying? You, you should take that in consideration. You know, one one thing I always, you know, said, said with the Monday Night Wars, when you start getting, you know, business people involved and looking at quarter hours and every 10 minutes what's happening on the screen, I think we get into some of that. You know, I go back to some of the house shows I went to as a kid, or if you even watch like, like primetime wrestling or old superstars, how people used to take the time and really tell the stories, the manager involvement. Even when wrestling wasn't happening, that the announcers, you know, taking the time to tell a story, Nowadays, most guys don't get a chance to talk. Like they don't get a chance to put, maybe a couple guys do, but you know, most of the talent doesn't get an opportunity to talk or get their story across or their character across where I came from, what my motivation is, why I'm doing these evil things, you know, and, and to tell that story. I mean, what, what are your thoughts about that? Being able to, to, you know, that, you know, as a process. I think, um... I think uh, they 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 have the reins too tight sometimes, um, you know, and they they want to give you a script to to read from as opposed to letting you be in that moment and be that character and feel that emotion, you know, and kind of just giving you a direction. Hey, this is what we need. It's what we need you to say, but say it how you would say it, you know, and giving people that opportunity to go out there and say whatever it is. Which is funny you say that because I always feel like there's not enough wrestling on TV. And that there's a whole lot of filler, but um, um, they're not really saying anything, you know. It's just like you said, they're not saying a, a, a doggone thing, you know. And and you know, we could we could stand to take advantage of the storytelling and the backstories, and um, you know, trying to trying to get to know the characters, I guess, um, as well as seeing more matches in the ring, seeing more people wrestle. You know, and and it's just yeah, it's just a lot a lot of stuff that I I think, you know, and I don't know, who am I? <laughs> well, uh before we get out of here, I, I do wanna ask this. And I hope I'm not blowing the cover, but well you said it yourself. Kong is a good dude, man. If the fans love like he's really a good dude. He's always stayed really humble and everything. So I wanna hear what is one of your best Fan experiences, man. Uh, I got uh, a, a couple of kids. Uh, they're a set of twins. One is deaf and one has cerebral palsy. And um, every time I go up to St. Catharines, Ontario, uh, they're there. You know, they're at the show and they they buy my T-shirts and my pictures and they'll bring their friends and they'll they'll sign language to them. And, um, you know, he, he always tells me, uh, I forget how he does it, but somehow he, he'll sign KK uh, and then say friend. And like, I about cry every time. And I'm like, <laughs> I gotta hold this in, you know? It's such a, such a cool experience to know that, you know, even without that, that child being able to hear my words or hear, you know, anything I say or, or, or any noises or whatever, I still have an impact on him. He still, you know, loves me, you know, both of them do. And it, it's crazy. And I love them to death because, yeah, man, without them, we'd be a bunch of weirdos, you know, just rolling around in spandex with each other. Facts, facts. And if, if you're into that, do you. But, you know, we pro wrestlers need the fans, so. For sure, for sure. Daryl, do you got anything else for him? 
You know, you know, one one thing I, you know, I, I think that is also different about today when you think about the past is that everybody kind of looks the same. You know, uh, same kind of tights, same kind of. The, actually, we got to talk about your tights too. Like, who you make tights for? Where you get your tights? Yeah, we'll same get there, kind of we'll tights, there, same kind of body shape. And, and and you know, when you think about the past, everybody was unique. You know, when people, when you saw a guy, you knew that guy's a wrestler. You know, when I see yourself, I'm like, that guy's a wrestler. You know, he didn't look like me because yeah, I'm not a wrestler. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and that's, I think, you know, with your uniqueness, your look and what you do, you know, should be, uh, every promotion in the world should be coming after you just because that's unique. It's different. I would like to think so. I, I definitely don't feel like uh, I'm the next door neighbor type, which is, you know, what I always equate, you know, most of wrestling today. You know, you 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 don't want to. No no fan is going to want to pay their money, their hard earned money, to go out and see somebody wrestle that they can walk outside their house and see just hanging out next door. You know what I mean? Um, and so you know, I, I I try not to use that as a knock, but there's so many guys that you know fall into that that five ten 150 pound range you know and and then they have every excuse in the world as to why they they can't or won't uh do anything about it you know like lift weights and and you know stay in shape or get in shape or anything like that to try to get better to try to stand out um but yeah i i for me you know i've always felt i was going to be different i was going to be you know if I couldn't be Hulk Hogan, I could be, you know, the guy that Hulk Hogan made money with. For sure, for sure. And like Daryl said, if you could shout out if they want to get a hold of you again on, well, first of all, name some of the guys that you done made gear for, man. Oh, well, I'm in the process of making some for uh, um, Uha Nation. What is his name on TV now? Uh, Apollo Cruz. Yes. <laughs> Making stuff for him. I've made stuff for Rhino. I've made stuff for uh, uh, the Chris brothers from Impact. Um, uh, uh, Ace, Ace, uh, whatever. Not I can't think of his name. Ace, the little one. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I've been doing this a long time. Obviously, I don't remember everybody, and I'll get overly excited about doing certain stuff. But um, yeah. You know, I've, I've I've been making gear since 2007, and uh, you know, if you if you if you need some, you know, hit me up. Uh, give me a buzz on Facebook under Steve Wilson or Congo Kong. Uh, usually, if you type in Congo Kong, Steve Wilson will come up, and I'll probably answer that one quicker than I would any of the other ones. Or you can hit me up on Twitter at Real Congo Kong or on IG at Kong Osiris seven eight. And um, yeah, you know, let's let's get talking. Or if you you know if you're looking to get trained or whatever, and you feel like you know it's worth a while to come down to Indiana um, a couple times a week and, and get that training, I'll be more than glad to help you. Nice, nice. Well, like I said, Darren, we don't want to hold him up too long. But Darren, you got anything else for? No, no. I mean, you've been an excellent guest. I mean, your insights have been excellent. And and and, and again, like Deshaun said, like you know. A very articulate, very founded person, man. It's, 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 it's great to see that in the business. Well, call. Thanks, man. It's time when we call this segment. We give you 60 seconds. It's called Ring the Bell. That's when you just close out. You can say whatever you want to. You can promote yourself, say something inspirational, whatever you want to say. 60 seconds. Go ahead and ring that bell, man. All right. Well, I would just like to tell uh, anybody that's looking to get in this business, go find something else to do. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, if you have a dream to follow, man, I can't even tell you how important it is to listen to your heart, you know, because we only get one of these things, as far as I know. One life, one chance to do it, and do it right, and to, to do what you love. And I believe that when I come before God, he's not going to ask me about uh certain things that other people think that you know he'll ask me about i believe that he's gonna ask me hey what did you do with this gift that i gave you and i'll be able to tell him i lived i lived i i was able to do this this and this i wanted to do this and i did it my way you know and that's important follow your dreams for sure for sure well Colin, thank you for coming on the show today i hope you had a good time man it was great interview. I did, man. great interview 
For sure, man. For sure. Well, man, go back, chill, have fun, eat, and we're going to see you in the ring back when this all opens back up, bro. All right, take yes, care, sir. Bro. Yes, sir. Looking forward to it. For all sure, right, bro. Sure. All right, take care. Daryl, another dope show, man. Another one. They keep coming and coming. I, I thought, oh, can we look up on one or two guests? But to have an endless parade, man, this has been fantastic. It's been, it's been a blessing. We've had some of the top guys in the wrestling world. We've had so much insight, even stuff I haven't known in my many years, man. And, guys, I'm telling you, keep following us on Instagram, at The Whip Show Podcast, Facebook, The Whip Show, YouTube, and even on Anchor. That's where our podcast is located, anchor.fm.com slash The Whip Show. Did you see what we got? We got tons of stuff. If you want to sponsor the show, Make sure you hit us up, the Whip Show Podcast at gmail.com. Get a shout out. Get your company sponsored right here on the Whip Show. You see what we do each and every week. So uh, I'm not going to tell the secret what we got coming up. But we got another big one. It's, it's going to get a little Hollywood in the building. We'll just say that. We'll leave it at that, man. So, guys, thank you again. I am Deshaun Whip Dog Whipple and Devastating Girl Pace here in the Control Center. And we will see you next time on the Wrestling Heroes and Insiders Podcast, a.k.a. The Whip Show. Take care, guys.